Here in upstate New York, winter is finally releasing its cold grip on the planet. With the seasonal change comes the grand phase change, the melting of snow into mud. In this lesson, we'll connect the three phases of matter with the six possible transitions between these phases. We'll also represent the energy change of these. We'll use graphs to represent the energy change associated with these phase changes. We saw earlier in the chapter that attractive IMFs between molecules seek to hold these molecules together as a solid. On the other hand, the molecule's kinetic energy seeks to break apart the IMFs and turn the molecules into gases. While it is impossible to change the strengths of the IMFs attracting molecules of the same substance, we can increase the kinetic energy of the particles by increasing the temperature. Thus, the IMFs of any substance can eventually be broken by adding enough heat. This turns the substance into a gas. There are six ways to transition from one phase of matter to another, and they each have their own specific name. Some have two names. You are probably familiar with melting and freezing, which transition between the liquid and solid phase. Vaporization is the transition between liquid and gas, while condensation is the transition between gas back to liquid. The two you might not be familiar with are sublimation and deposition, which are transitions directly between gas and solid. If you've ever seen frost appear on grass or a window, then you've encountered deposition. At temperatures below zero degrees Celsius, liquid water cannot exist, and only solid water or water vapor are observed. This figure shows each phase on the energy level diagram. The arrows represent phase changes. Each phase change has an associated change in energy, which chemists refer to as enthalpy. The blue arrows represent the endothermic processes. These processes require energy be added to a substance in order to break apart the IMFs. You are probably familiar with adding energy to ice in order to melt the ice. The red arrows represent the exothermic processes, which release energy when the IMFs form between molecules. The values of the enthalpy change of the exothermic processes is exactly opposite to the values of the endothermic processes. It is universally true that the enthalpy of vaporization is greater than the enthalpy of fusion. In order to vaporize a material, you must completely break its intermolecular forces, which takes far more energy than simply melting a material, since not all of the IMFs break during melting. You can also see from this image that the enthalpy of sublimation is exactly equal to the enthalpy of fusion plus the enthalpy of vaporization. What if someone asked you how much energy it would take to boil an ice cube? This process would require a temperature change and two phase changes. We already know the equation used to calculate changes in temperature. It's Q equals MC delta T. We will use this equation to calculate the heat required to change the temperature of a substance when we are not changing its phase. For phase changes, we will learn a new equation, Q equals N delta H. During a phase change, all the heat added to a substance goes toward breaking the IMFs between particles, and the temperature will not change. By multiplying the moles of the substance times the phase change enthalpy, we can calculate the energy needed to complete the phase change. Note that these two equations usually use different units. So watch for that. To demonstrate this concept, we'll do an extended practice problem. To answer the question, how much heat would it take to turn very cold ice at negative 50 degrees to very hot water at 150 degrees? But before we do any math, let's break apart what is happening in this problem. Specifically, there are five processes which occur. First, our ice starts out too cold to melt, 
we have to raise the temperature of the ice to the melting point of water, which is zero degrees Celsius. Heating ice from negative 50 to zero is no different than any other calorimetry process. And we'll use Q equals MC delta T to calculate the heat needed. Once we have ice at its melting point, we need to add enough heat to break the water-water bonds and turn it into a liquid. This process uses the phase change enthalpy and the new equation I introduced two slides ago. Now that we have liquid water, we need to heat the liquid water to its boiling point of 100 degrees Celsius. We'll use Q equals MC delta T for the temperature change. With water at its boiling point, any further heat will go into breaking apart water's IMFs and turning the water into a gas. We'll use the enthalpy of vaporization for this step. Lastly, we have 100 degree water vapor, which we continue heating until it's 150 degrees. Temperature changes use the equation Q equals MC delta T. This might make more sense if we represent it graphically on something called a heating curve. Let's go through each step. The temperature is on the left axis and the amount of heat added is on the bottom axis. Let's go through each step. The first step heats our very cold ice up to the melting point. This step corresponds to a Q equals MC delta T equation. The second step melts the ice, but there is no temperature change. To calculate the energy needed to melt the ice, we'll multiply the moles of water times its enthalpy of fusion. The third step heats the liquid water to its boiling point. The energy change here is another Q equals MC delta T equation. The fourth step vaporizes the water using water's enthalpy of vaporization. The last step is another Q equals MC delta T calculation to bring water vapor up to its final temperature. The total energy change of this process will equal the sum of the energy changes of the five individual steps. All we have left to do is plug in the numbers. And I will note that this is the biggest they can get. Three temperature changes and two phase changes. Likely on an exam, we would only give you a portion of this problem. The values in the table will be given to you, except for the melting and boiling points of water which you're expected to remember. Notice the values of C are different depending on whether the water is a solid, a liquid, or a gas. Finally, we can set up one big equation and plug in each of the numbers. Notice that I converted the enthalpy values from kilojoules to joules so that the units match those in the MC delta T expressions. Adding it all up, I get 115,830 joules, or about 116 kilojoules. If you can keep the image of the heating curve in mind, you can know which equation to use for each step of the process. The purple lines represent temperature change without phase change. For those, we use Q equals MC delta T. The orange lines represent phase changes without temperature changes. We use N delta H for these sections.